Sacchi. But uh, this weekend, it's round nine of the FIM Motocross World Championship, the Italian Grand Prix. The circuit here in Maggiore, just over 1,500 metres long, a little bit shorter than it used to be back in 99, and certainly uh, back in the day when it was here for the Motocross of Nations and the Masters of Motocross series, but the riders like it, and those who remember it and remember racing here, they certainly like it, and uh, I was talking to Eric Gabor on our MX Life studio show earlier on this afternoon, around about 2, 2.30, 2.40, something like that, and um, he actually likes the new changes here. He said change was necessary here, and they've done a really good job. You know, a little bit of twist with the old and the new. The start's rate a little bit shorter, but a lot safer as well, because you used to rejoin at the back of the start and run down into the first corner from the left-hand side now as we look at it, as we look at the start list from the qualifying race that determined the grid positions from yesterday. Gertje Paulant starting on pole position on his factory Kawasaki from Tommy Searle. Kenda Dijker, Max Nagel, Xavier Borg and David Ugneri with Kai Rowley starting in seventh after what was uh, an up and down um, race for him really, coming from 19th. But if you're joining us for the first time, here's a close look at the circuit here in Maggiore. Well, that was the plan, but uh, having one or two technical difficulties here this late stage in the afternoon, I think everything's melting. The weather conditions here, very, very hot indeed in Italy. Here we go, second time looking. GoPro track preview with David Philippotts and David Guarneri, both rocking up on uh, old school graphics. Hello, everybody. I'm David Guarneri, riding for Marchetti Racing. We are here, GP of Italy. Hello, I'm David Philippotts with the Honda Garibaldi team. I'm there to Majora. And you see my la lap now. Ciao. And you can just check. David Granieri, number 39, rocking the 1986 colours of an old KTM. And David uh, Philippart's also graphics from the 1986, even got the blue seat cover. But short start straight into the first turn. You can double or single to the outside. Philippart's then dropping into turn two. Turn three, just short off camber, then hard and slick. A little bit rutty through there earlier on in the day, but then uh, tripling up onto the top. Not easy on an MX2 bike, but easier on an MX1. You can go wide, leave the door open. That can allow a rider up the inside, as Guarneri just did then. But it's uh, a big, steep downhill into that bottom corner, which is turn four. Then it's uphill into the horseshoe. Through the left-hand turn, dropping back down into uh, turn seven. And then up over Omara's Leap, the corner tabletop on the side of the hill here. Then it drops down to the side into this bottom right hander. See how the body working from that camera angle. Shoulders taking a lot as they hit the Monster Energy tabletop dropping downhill. See the movement from the upper body of uh, David Philippotts there as he sweeps downhill off the single off cambered here you can see falling from right to left as we look at it but left to right from the rider's point of view so always struggling for traction then it's uphill off cambered through the left hard and slick through there then we have the motel tabletop on the corner again off cambered and slick through here before hitting the motel step down not as big as it looks actually then we have this nice corner uphill step for dropping into the trees a real steep uphill left banking as well out of there, big step down, through the right-hander over the single, past the entry to pit lane. Then at the end of that straight, we have the finish corner and the finish line jump. Well, the 15-second board goes up, the crowd gets to their feet. And uh, Adam Wheeler joins me live for this broadcast, and we'll bring him in in a moment. But uh, when that five-second board turns, the gate will drop any moment now. Go check Paul and Tommy Sir up the inside, alongside, I think, Kenny Viker in third in the grid, but Max Nagel at the inside from uh, Rui Gonçalves, I think, oh, Xavier Borg. And Paul that comes out in first place, I think, as he heads into turn one, turn two. Yes, he does. So just what Paul had needed, a lot different to what he had in moto number one, Adam Wheeler. Yeah, Colin Vassell down there in about 12th position, just going past the camera now. Well, that is not the start he wanted. Exactly. Well, Billy McKenzie getting a good start. And... Um, but Goche Paul and is who's in the driving seat, Tony Cairoli to the roars of the Italian crowd. Storms in the second position, pushing.
The Frenchman, Xavier Gould, down into third place. Jeremy Van Horbeek in fourth. Max Nagel in fifth as they drop downhill from the horseshoe. Mackenzie in sixth, looking to go up the inside of Nagel and succeeds as well, ahead of uh, Kenda Dijka. Over Omar as they go for the first time. And it's pretty heavy down in this bottom corner this time around. A little bit of work on on the track in between MX1 and MX2, first and second races. And still pretty slick in some places, but... Uh, oh. Oh, Van Horvick just a little bit short on the tabletop as he came in to land there. The back end just kicked around on him as he came in. But this is what Gauthier Paulin wanted. Oh, oh Billy McKenzie goes down. Loses the front end in that left-hander. Tries to pick himself up. And the Monster Energy Yamaha rider will uh, be kicking himself after that because he uh, put himself in a decent position, got a good start. But up front, Gauthier Paulin just trying to make a break for it. Yeah, just keep an eye on Dassault here, Paul. I mean, he's the, the uh, race, first race winner, so it'd be interesting to see Carreras. where he can make it up to. Carreras Is dropped to third. Xavier Gould's gone back through. Carreras struggling. He had a tension on his knee in the break. Uh, left knee, the one that he broke the ligament on in 2008 in South Africa. So, you know, will he be able to go uh, you know, full pace for this whole moto? Well, I didn't know that. So, obviously, that's the benefit of you going down there in between motos and uh, sharing that information. But over the line for the first time, as Van Horbeek goes a little bit deep, so too does uh, Kenda Dijka. It's Paul Lamp from four, Cairoli and Horbeek. The Dijka is fifth, Nagel six, Bobrachev. So, both the Hondas good starts this time around from DeSalle, Searle and Guineri. We saw McKenzie just right going off. And this is also Borg going up the inside of Cairoli there. So, while we were distracted there for a moment, Xavier Borg just uh, taking the opportunity with both hands and uh, finding a way back past the uh, defending champion, Tony Cairoli. Not often that uh, Xavier Borg gets to say that. And that's uh, two 350s at the front of the field. It's Borg right in the 350. And then just behind them, Van Horbeek on a 450 Kawasaki. So uh, the uh, 450s of the Kawasaki racing team, official team, topping, tailing the, uh, the KTMs ahead of him. Yeah, I mean, Cairoli was limping to the life bar. I really don't think we're going to see, like, you know, a fully strong... Uh, world champion in this heat. I mean, if he can catch Paul Lan, I'll be amazed. I mean, he's, he it should be relatively easy for him to get past Paul, but uh, oh, I don't know, Van Horbeek also holding up Kenda Dijka. But you know what, though? He didn't look comfortable in the first race, even if he uh, hadn't tweaked his knee, you know what I mean? It was He had two little crashes, one on the left, in that corner where Xavier Borg passed him, and obviously he's looking to go back past Xavier Borg now, and then one in the right-hander at the bottom of the horseshoe oh, here. Both scrimming their way through. And uh, it didn't look like any of them were particular high impact. Maybe the left, was it the left knee that he had surgery? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because he, uh, in that left-hander where Billy McKenzie crashed, um, he tried to put his leg down to stab himself, so maybe the damage was done there. Yeah, I mean, the KTM team is all closed off, you know, the, 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 doc the doctors are in there, so... You just kind of hope it wasn't too serious. He was limping to the line, so maybe he's had a painkiller, some injection, or some kind of icing going on, so... There was no swelling, that was the important thing. I think he was worried about that. He was waiting half an hour to see if there was any kind of reaction, so... Maybe he, uh, he got away with it. That's the double jump coming out of uh, Turn 1. Xavier Gore getting over there. I think Kenda Dijk and maybe Van Horbeek as well. Tony Cairoli struggling to find a way past the Frenchman. The crowd probably wondering uh, what happened to the real Tony Cairoli. At this stage of the race, going from second to third. And uh, Xavier, uh, sorry, Gauthier Paulin, already three seconds clear of this battle. Oh, oh Cairoli can't afford any mistakes. He fought hard then. It's a good job it wasn't his right knee. It was problematic there because he would have seriously felt that shoot through right in the center of the kneecap. And uh, watch the Dijka ball. I mean, he's just like, you know, riding rough shot over this this track. You know, everyone else is like kind of treating it with a bit of respect. I mean, the, the ruts aren't nowhere near as big as they were in the first moto, but, you know, he's just uh, using that strength to, to barrel across. Ooh, I mean, look, I'm just wondering if the Dijk is allowed to go past at the moment, whether he's just going to, you know, just sit it out and see what yeah. uh, what goes on, but he and can't afford to sit there for too long because uh, Van Horvick will close in, and Dijk are making a move now on Kai Rowley. And just look at the back of the picture, Clement de Salle catching up to Max Nagel on that factory Honda as well. Yeah, Nagel uh, having a good start with the Salle, our winner from Moto number one. So let's, uh, with half an hour to go, so very early stage of race two, go to Paul and three seconds clear of Xavier Borg. He's in second, but now it's Kendi Dijk there, number nine in third on Red Bull KTM. Cairoli's dropped to fourth, Van Horbeek on the Kawasaki's fifth. As Dijk makes his move to second, trying to find a way around the outside of Xavier Borg, and again goes through with relative ease. Paul and already over the finish line. Dijk is second now, Borg third, Cairoli fourth, Van Horbeek looking for a way through in fifth. Then it's Nagel, then De Sal, Bobashev, and Tommy Searle bringing up what eighth place. I mean, it looks like a very kind of physical track, this Paul. Would you say that? I mean, yes, definitely. And, uh, you know, there's some big holes. And Tony Cairoli losing a lot of ground now to Dijka and uh, 
Van Horbeek both going through. So Cairoli desperate now. This is going to be one of those situations, Adam Wheeler, of uh, points on the table, damage limitation. Uh, but for the first time this year, or one of the first times this year, as Van Horbeek gets very close to the outside markers of the uh, trackside banners there, might be one of the first times that we don't see Cairoli on the podium in uh, 2013. He's only ever been lower than second, and he's had that three times. The rest of the times, he's been a winner. Yeah, so that would be a shame to kind of lose that record of all just hitting the outside right there. But, um, you know, obviously a big shame in terms of the event because I think this is the biggest crowd I've seen at an Italian, you know, meeting since the motocross of nations at Francia Corto. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a facility that can hold that quantity of people, which is already a difference for an Italian Grand Prix. But uh, Zambia Ball just predictably, you know, getting a little bit in the way. I think Tony might just assess this race, hang back, find his, his rhythm and then push on from there and see if anyone else gets tired, which might well happen to Didaika. Well, this is what we know about Tony Cairoli. Even at 80%, if that's what he's riding at now, oh, he can... Turn there. Oh, nice move. Great move, in fact. Oh, Borg's gone, I think. Yes, oh. Borg has gone down. He's tagged him. And uh, so, too... Oh, that's uh, somebody else. That's a different incident. But uh, the 92, one that's of the, the wild card riders. Yeah, Mattia Cervelloni. But, yeah, Xavier Borg just feeding the, uh, the rear wheel of Cairoli's. 350 KTM as he stormed through up the inside. There might be another angle from uh, high on the camera point there, but certainly Cairoli just looked over his shoulder there, knew that the contact had been made. But before that incident, I was about to say, Cairoli, we know even at 80%, he could probably, you know, still rely yeah. on his fitness just to pull him through. That was, uh, yeah, Cervelloni going down. Just kind of across the line. But that right there where Cairoli went inside, I mean, there's barely any room between them, so I was surprised he didn't kind of like just knock Xavier off balance in the middle of the corner on the apex. Nagel, the Sal, and then Searle at the back of the picture there, and Kawasaki, so... Yeah, Cairoli, though, he's in fourth place. So Nagel, fifth, the Sal, sixth, Searle, seventh, Bobashev, eighth. So Searle found a way past again, Bobashev that time around. Guarneri, ninth, Sean Simpson in tenth. On the uh, Richie TM, here we go. There's the other bit of tag team. Said. Yeah, had to lift his leg, and then he went sprawling, and... Uh, oh, hard landing in the end. Yeah, Cairoli uh, knows it, for he has a little look behind there. Maybe yeah. just the... Uh, might be a handshake afterwards, I think. That'll uh, certainly ease it, the tension, I guess. And Paul Lan, you know, these, these first three guys, they're kind of lapping within tenths of a second of each other. There's really no difference. But look uh, at his style around here. Up on the pegs everywhere yesterday, looked good in qualifying. Shame about the bad start in moto number one. Uh, but this is what we were seeing from Gauthier Paul Lan yesterday, just up on the pegs. Especially when he comes down past pit lane. You watch, he gets the jump and he's on the pegs all the way through the finish corner. He was yesterday and it just looked effortless from him. Yeah, I mean, he's been riding like that all year, hasn't he? I mean, technically... You know, he said yesterday in an interview that, uh, you know, he's just riding that Kawasaki like it's a 250, like he can do whatever he wants. And interestingly, if you have a look, you know, on that factory bike, they're developing, well, developing they've got a, a special kind of little rear suspension switch system for the starts, yeah. where they're able to just lower that rear shock. And, um, you know, I think the starts for Gotti Apollon have been better this year, and that's why we've seen him running more regularly at the front, because the MX-1, the level of the MX-1 class is here. If you don't go in those first two laps, then then you're not going to do anything, as perhaps like Tommy Sell is proving now, or even like Evgeny Bobrychev or Max Nagel. Max Nagel's had the speed, but he just hasn't been starting in the top three. Yeah. I mean, I was told about that suspension device last week at the French Grand Prix. Unfortunately, it didn't work for him in the second moto there, but uh, or maybe in the qualifying race, but... Well, actually, Paul, it did work for him because he was like one... He was one of the first around the first corner, but that crash by Max Nagel just put yeah, him wide. Yeah, pushed everybody wide. But, uh, yeah, you notice that the bike does sit lower behind the start line compared to uh, the other bikes. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, uh, something that they've been working on. And, obviously, it's working for them. So, uh, Paul Ann leads. I just saw uh, Kyrelli come over the line a minute ago as we were talking then. Just uh, doing a bit of a Michael Jackson uh, <laughs> correction. <laughs> so, I'm sure our eagle-eyed camera guys will be there. We might even see a replay of that. But, uh, Paul Ann leads. Sadaika second. Van Horbeek third. Kyrelli fourth. It's only 6.9 seconds off of Gertje Paul Ann just about uh, two seconds down on Van Horbeek, so he was quickest of his own laps that time around, and a second quicker than Van Horbeek, so Cairoli in the ascendancy. Come on, out, 25 minutes plus two to go, as he goes after Max Nagel, so our winner from race one still trying to find a way past the German. These are Nagel's kind of conditions, aren't they? Hard, rugged, loose, slick, unpredictable. And he seems to deal with these conditions very, very well. Yeah. Adam Wheeler. That's right, Paul. And he's, he's just uh, very nimble, you know. He's hard to pass. 
I think that's where DeSalle's uh, just trying to struggle to make a couple of attempts to get next to him. Like I say, it's early stages of the race still, so you know he's probably not pushing crazily hard because this track will punish errors. Um, Kevin Strybos, his teammate on that factory Suzuki, all weekend struggling, trying different things with the setup, just can't get comfortable. So the same with Joel Rowlands on the factory Yamaha. It's, it's really dividing the, the riders this place. Don't even think I mentioned Joel Rowlands in the first race. Uh, didn't do any laps. Mm, crashed on the first lap, and then I think just uh, pulled in, just didn't didn't get going. Just been, it's a tough season for him in MX1 at the moment, isn't it, Joel? Yeah, absolutely. I think since that concussion in, in round uh, three, four, eight, four in Italy, uh, you know, I think that's the second or third, you know, of his career. It's just been uh, he's just been trying to make progress and come back from that. Kai Rowley, that's the gap between him and Van Horbeek, so it is starting to come down ever so slightly. But you can see, not comfortable in that no. left-hander at the top of the hill at all. Right-hander's not a problem, and unfortunately for him, this is an anti-clockwise track, so uh, yeah. I'm just wondering whether there's a, an imbalance in terms of more lefts than rights, and that might just affect him just a little bit, maybe. In terms of his corner speed and able to uh, close down, here's another one of those corners. Probably just holds the leg just a little bit higher, can't get down as much as he wants to in the corner, can't throw it in, yeah. especially... Uh, just around this long left into the uh, the loop at the end. There's Barragan and Simpson, Sean Simpson, Factory TM. Yeah, Simpson uh, already in 10th, but that's Strybos. Strybos, where's he going? Steaming up the inside of Barragan, so Nick's a position. That. Yeah. Oh, you thought about mm -hmm. it, had to yeah. probably pull out of the challenge because Simpson didn't get over it. Rue Gonçalves did make it behind him, though. So there's Kai Riley dropping down the hill. And then Max Nagel. And then there's a yellow Suzuki of Commander Sal, and then Tommy Searle, number 100 here on the green Kawasaki, the CLS Monster Energy Pro Circuit machine. Him and Guarneri had a, a big moment through here in the first race. Uh, Guarneri squared off and came up the inside. Tommy Searle didn't back out of it. Neither did Guarneri. They tagged bars and went down hard. Uh, yeah. Any uh, repercussions from that or any implications, no, any injuries? No? Just a few unrepeatable words uh, <laughs> from, the, from the Tommy Searle camp. Um, Saying that it was uh, out of order, the, the move that he called on him. <laughs> Okay, then think back to uh, Mantova, uh, Tommy Sale on Sean Simpson, uh, MX2 days. Yeah. <laughs> Racing incident. Yeah, you get, you get what you give and vice versa. And all the rest of it. But, Can um, yeah, ooh. Ooh. Orbic is getting Orbic. like, Orbic Chef yesterday, you know, almost like wanted to do a zigzag between those advertising boards. It's, it's very sketchy. I think, um, you know, just to wheel out a popular cliche for you, you probably mentioned it a couple of times, but it's just, it's, um, it's a shame by these pitches you cannot understand how steep some of these hills are and yeah. so like how you know sharp some of the ruts are it's yeah it's you, um you'll not be able to walk up it it's um you know it, it is mind-blowing actually you know i i raced here in 97 for the 125 grand prix and uh it was impressive then and there's been a lot of work going on but the actual hills haven't been touched on the first part of the circuit you know the the first uphill the big downhill even the horseshoe um just after the big downhill which is uh, what turn six is steep going up yeah. you know halfway up the bank and uh, you only need a moment there a slight pause and you tip it over really really easily we're going down a pit lane here's amy Thierry, these last few grand prix we've seen some really good performances from your two kawasaki boys goto is leading the race much better start this time yeah now the the second it was better with the start now gautier uh, normally if you continue like this he could finish at, at the first place and we are also happy because Jeremy now is uh, he fight for the second position. And uh, we have a big chance today to have a podium for the boss rider. Yeah, Thierry, she's at Suzoni, just uh, alluded to that fact, but uh, Gauthier Paulin leading the race at the moment. And uh, he is in pole position in terms of winning the overall Grand Prix here. I was talking to Glenn Dempsey, actually, from... Uh, uh, I guess, was he Thor? He's a Thor representative, isn't he? Um, but he also has a management uh, company. But he was saying, yeah, you know, everyone's remembering this Grand Prix. This was on Saturday morning before we'd even turned the wheel. He said, everyone remembers this place for the 1986 motocross of nations. But wouldn't it be cool if Gauthier Paulin was remembered for beating Tony Cadiferoli around here as an Italian Grand Prix, you know, as a Frenchman? Almost doing the, the, the opposite yeah. to, you know, last week, you know, Cairoli winning. Uh, an Italian winning in France last week and at the moment there's one point but he cannot do any more than he's doing to Dijka he's in second place at the moment so it's down to Commander Sal whether he makes any points and uh, pulls back a couple there and uh, but he's got a point over to Dijka that'll give him a bit of breathing space but uh, Kai Rowley only got 36 points so it's going to be a big ask for him to get onto the podium because uh, 36 to Sal next on 41 and Bobrachev oh. goes down again coming out of the horseshoe time, I think. That's just out of this left-hander here. That's the horse I was on about. 
it's not a difficult corner when you look at it on the TV, but it is so steep. Yeah. You know, in terms of uh, the actual oh, really just drop yeah. down, you know, little one post corner. That's why some of the riders go uh, high and wide. Watch this, Bobashev from Destiny just gets cross rutted. Hurlings crashed here yesterday, so it catches out everybody else. That's where he crashed in the first moto. It's yeah. almost a carbon copy. So the back end digging in, and of course, uh, the front end getting away from him, giving him absolutely nowhere to go, the Russian. And then he goes down, but uh, Kai Rowley slightly over jumping the Monster Energy finish line jump, but he's got Tadaika Van Horbeek in his sights, and he's going after now uh, second position in the race. That'll certainly help his cause out. So um, Blink. What you were saying a moment ago, Paul, about the nostalgia feeling, I think uh, Pip Byer also laid claim to, to Majora in uh, the press conference yesterday to announce Stefan Evert's been with the KTM team for another three years. I mean, he pointed out that he won the Grand Prix in 1999. So, yeah. you know, it's, um, like you said, the track has changed a little bit, but there, there really is a kind of a, a, an old school spirit of motocross here. And you can see that from the, the attendance from the fans. They're not all here just to see Clay Rowley. They're here to just to kind of celebrate the fact that, the, you know, Grand Prix has come back to this, this region and this track. And the hanging over the fence is back as well, you know. The the fans getting close to the action as uh, Papa Cairoli looks on. Looking to see what uh, Tony can do in the second moto, but... This is, a, this is a case of Cairoli. I think we've seen it a couple of times, you know, in the last few years, where he's, instead of reacting to others in the race, he's really just going his own speed. And then it's dragging him up to the likes of, you know, Jerry Van Horbeck and also Ken Dijker. I'm sure he might even get signaled towards the end of the moto, or he's going to look behind and think, well, you know, Cairoli needs these points because we're in round 9 or 17. We're, you know, we're entering the second half of the season, especially with Paul Ann winning. Well, we just saw a moment ago the overall podium classification. Cairoli not on the podium at the moment. So, yes, he needs to find a way past Van Horbeek and the Dijker. But uh, Commander Sal, where's he now? He's in fifth place, so he's behind Cairoli. But look how many seconds back. Nine seconds down, in fact. So, uh, certainly not going to be challenging for a race win as the... Uh, Three riders, Dijk, Van Horbeek, and Cairoli bounce their way through that final turn. Saw uh, Tonkov having a big moment through there in uh, MX2 race one, which was unfortunate for him because he could have had his first ever MX2 podium uh, earlier on today. But That's right, the old, uh, you know, if you're going to cross the finish line, make sure you do it on your motorcycle. That's right. But so the two and a half seconds split in these three, so it's uh, it, it kind of looks um, a little bit less than that now. And Cairoli just having a little look at Van Horbeek, trying to work out where the safest route will be uh, without risking another tumble. Yeah. Down past the swimming pool at the top of the hill. Fans go crazy. crazy. That big jump down there, I mean, you did that on Friday, you know, riding sort of like the, the, the three laps on the on the media experience thing. I mean, did you kind of hesitate when you came to the edge there? Because it looks like a real, you know, stomach in the mouth job. I mean, I've ridden this track before anyway. Uh, I'd say that it's probably higher or steeper than any of the hills at Fox Hills. I know that. Uh, but the ground was a little bit softer then. It's firmer now because uh, the guys have ridden it and compacted it down. Um, didn't hesitate other than the fact that because it was so soft, I didn't know what the reaction would be from the bike, you know, digging in how soft yeah. it was. But once I'd got that first lap out of the way, yeah, the second and third laps that I did were uh, perfect. Oh, Van Horbeek's not running any wide. resistance, is he? Cairoli, though, left leg, problematic. Drops in nicely to the inside, but he has a stab through there. And uh, he would have felt that as well. But uh, the adrenaline already flowing now for Tony Cairoli. He'll pick up another point. Where was he? Uh, that'll be, uh, yeah, two points actually, wouldn't it? Because uh, 18 points goes yeah. to uh, 20. He will pass the Diker. He will pass him. Whether he's allowed through or he'll get him, uh, Tony Carrera is going to finish second in this race if he doesn't make a mistake. So, will that be enough points for the podium? That's the question. Sal also trying to close down the gap. He'll be next on the back of Van Horbeek. You know, he's got nine, eight, nine seconds and, you know, 15 minutes plus two laps to do it. Jeff Alessi, the American wildcard rider here that was uh, pulling over at the end of the uh, pit lane straight there, allowing the leaders through, riding the uh, JKSK Gavin Yamaha. Not had a great weekend this weekend, the American. Another rider finding it tough coming from America. Yeah, I mean, we have three Americans here in the paddock this weekend. I mean, I think, you know, it looks like Jimmy Dakotis could be heading back to the US now. Um, you know, Michael Lee pulling on his shoulder in practice this morning, couldn't start the MX2 races, and Jeff Alessi having trouble with his brakes and probably not taking any confidence yesterday. It's not really been a successful you know, story, has it? Tony Cairoli being urged on by the uh, Italian fans here. The majority that stayed on to witness his second moto. He was disappointing in race one. Two uncharacteristic mistakes from Tony Cairoli, losing the front end whilst leading in the tight little hairpin where we saw Xavier Borg go through in uh, the early stage of this race, the end of the first lap. 
And of course, at the bottom of the hill, just after where Bobashev crashed, that bottom right hander, the back end seemingly coming around on him there, dropping him down to fourth. Of course, the big winner in that little exchange was Gauthier Paulin that got him eventually into third place. Would have uh, pulled back a couple of points, but uh, Gauthier Paulin will be loving being up front at the moment with uh, just 14 and a half minutes plus two to go with Paulin. Looking at 45 points for the overall podium, to Dijk at 44, to Sal 41, Cairoli 38, and of course, uh, if Tony Cairoli goes past Kenda Dijk, that's not going to be enough points, is it, to get him third overall in the, in the Grand Prix? He needs three points. So Tony Cairoli then, 14 minutes plus two laps, Adam Wheeler, he's going after his uh, teammate. He will only pick up two more points here by going past Kenda Dijker. And for the first time this year, we might be looking at Cairoli finishing off the podium. Yeah, and uh, Clement de Salle's got 41 points and, you know, he, he's got that carrot on the stick of catching Jeremy Van Horbeek as well. How much is he going to tire in the closing stages? And just, you know, looking a little bit further down the leaderboard there, you've got Tommy Sells now past Max Nagel. I mean, he's far enough away perhaps not to have to worry about, but... Uh, but like you say, that the options are dwindling for Cairoli. If the Sal moves up another position, then that's it. We're going to have no uh, world champion on the podium for the first time, like you said, born in 2013. And also, uh, Tommy Sal is only four seconds, probably three and a half seconds down on Kamon Sal. Uh, but Sal that time around was a little bit quicker than Tommy Sal, so it just depends where though as well. Tommy Sal needs to find a way past to Sal. Cairoli needs to go past. Uh, Dedeika, that way then Cairoli will be on the podium. And Dedeika, was he just having a little wave there? I'm not sure if he was doing some roll-off or he was just like signaling at Cairoli. Um, you know, the, the classification we just got flashed up on the screen there was for the race. So Cairoli in third position here. Taking a look. Yep, he's saying, come on. No, is it a roll-off? It's just a roll-off there. I just think a roll-off. Twelve and a half minutes plus two to go. We're reaching the conclusion of this MX1 race two here. The ninth round of the FIM MX1 Motocross World Championship at the historic venue of Maggiore in northern Italy, the Italian Grand Prix. Gauthier okay, Paul and only 2.7 seconds now. Clear it was 3.2 or 3 at the start of the previous lap. But to Dijker in second, Cairoli in third, just uh, another one and a half seconds down on his teammate. That's those two there, to Dijker and Cairoli. Van Horbeek about three seconds further back on the green Kawasaki there in fourth place with De Sal in fifth. And five seconds further back, Tommy Searle in sixth. Max Nagel is seventh. And then Kevin Strybos, Guarnieri and Xavier Borg round out the top ten. But the question we were talking about a moment ago, Adam Wheeler, Tony Cairoli in uh, a situation here that we've not seen him in yet in 2013. Might not even be on the podium, and the biggest thing, not even in Italy. Yeah, that's going to be pretty big news, a pretty big disappointment as well, especially with David Philipparts. You know, I think he lives less than 10 kilometers away from this track. I mean, he was, you know, arguably a, a bigger crowd favorite, or just as much as Tony yesterday, and fighting for that pole position into the crash. I went to see him um, just before coming in here, Paul, and he's, you know, he's got a face like he, he has gone like 12 rounds or some heavyweight. Yeah, um, I saw him this morning yeah, when I arrived. It, it was a mess. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he's decided to sit out this one just, you know, trying to heal up and be okay for Sweden because he knows, you know, with the emotion and everything uh, of this race, it would be a risk just to get out there. Um, you know, it's... And I'm that just, wouldn't have yeah. been an easy decision to make for him. No. The Gary Baldi Honda rider, David Philippot. I mean, he crashed, he went down, he was struggling in the first motor. I think he was just tired of getting a bit beaten up. Um, you know, I think he sensibly, like sort of 28, 29 years old, has realized, you know, when it's perhaps, you know, safer to, to take a step back. Kenda Dijkamp making his teammate, Tony Cairoli, work for that second place. I was just thinking about that, Paul. I mean, it must be good to have, you know, a teammate of the caliber of Kenda Dijkamp. I mean, he's been around the block. He's been with most teams, most brands. Um, but, you know, when you look across the MX1 field, there's not many two rider teams there that have kind of supported themselves and, you know, each other and, and been at the front and been able to be in situations like this. Jeremy Van Horbeek's increased his level, increased his consistency, so the Kawasaki guys are doing it, but Suzuki not really, Yamaha not really, Tommy Sells on his own. So, you know, I mean, the Red Bull KTM have got a good mix of like, you know, oh, world championship winning experience and, you know, the old hand of the Diker who can still muscle that bike around. And uh, that's an interesting concept as well, you know, because you've got Cairoli, obviously the leader. Kenda Diker brought in 
as a replacement for the injured Max Nagel last year and then earned his ride due to the results that he got when he gained in confidence during the season last year. Of course, Kai Rowley and Dijk are very good friends anyway, turning out to be good teammates. Um, the situation with Kenna Dijk, has he signed uh, an extension to the contract for 2014 yet or is that news we're waiting to hear on? Yeah, I think, you know, we usually get to Sweden, which is the next Grand Prix round 10 in two weeks' time and that's when, you know, the pieces start to fall into place. I think you've got the big guns like Tommy Sell, maybe Clement de Salle, uh, you know, those guys will kind of fall into place first and everyone else will, will you know, Kenda Dijk and no resistance there, but, uh, no. you know, it's... I, th I think with Ken, he's just uh, he's just doing the perfect teammate role for him. He'll know that Tony's not 100% for this race and yeah. maybe a little bit concerned about, you know, his leg and what might happen if he makes another slip. So he'll have his back now if, you know, Van Horbeek or Dessau try and get a bit closer. And, you know, maybe they can try and both pull up to Paul Lann. He's only three and a half seconds away. We should be able to see him if, if we get a wider shot. I mean, Paul Lann, uh, the last lap, these two guys were half a second quicker. Um, now now Cairo is ahead. I mean, first ahead, I think he's got enough time, but who knows? Coming round to complete lap 14 on board with Gauthier Paulin. He's already through the chicane onto the start straight. And back into turn one, he's 4.2 seconds clear. So he's had a good lap. Has uh, Gauthier Paulin, 145.1 for him. Well, 145.130, 145.115 for Cairoli, 146.8 for uh, Kenda Dijkup. He's got four seconds over Jeremy Van Horbeek, so uh, that's a nice little buffer for him. But he can't afford to take his foot off the gas because... Uh, and Horbeek will come through. De Salas dropped right off the pace after looking really convincing in moto number one. It's a shame to see him down there, 11 seconds behind Jeremy Van Horbeek in that fifth place. Clement de Salle on the Rockstar Energy Suzuki World MX1 machine. Tommy Searle, likewise, four seconds down. He could have an impact on this Grand Prix in the last eight minutes plus two laps if he senses he can catch Clement de Salle, because that might help. Gautier Paul, uh, sorry, uh, Tony Cairoli find himself on the third step of the podium, but he needs to pass Clement de Salle. Does Tommy Sell for Cairoli to realise his dream, uh, well, an ambition of getting on the podium here in Maggior at least. Not that he's no stranger to being on the podium, of course, so it won't be that much of a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so it's round nine, Cairoli's won four, uh, five, sorry. Uh, de Salle won the first one, so Paul Anne's on possibly a third Grand Prix win then. Yeah. Back to back, Bulgaria and Portugal. Yeah. And second last week in France after that stunning uh, race one performance that had us on the edge of our seats at Hernay, of course. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. we got three different winners this year, Paul. I mean, I can't see anyone else really winning a Grand Prix unless there's some sort of freak kind of incident. Strybos, an outside chance. Of course, uh, Kendrick Dyke uh, could, if he strings it together, maybe uh, a little bit later on in the season. But, like I say, need uh, results to go his way. It's not unheard of. We look at the Kenny Bobashev down in 12th position. After a good start, where uh, he was just in and around 6th, uh, 7th with his teammate. Yeah, if you look a bit further down the field, you've still got the home Grand Prix factor for the likes of Tommy Sell, Matty Basin, Max Nagel, the Lautzitz ring. Uh, like you say, Kevin Stryber still got to go to Bastogne. So, um, yeah, a few more possibilities. Tony Cairoli setting the fastest, sector in sec uh, fastest time in Sector 2, which is uh, the green zone after the, uh, the bottom of the horseshoe. Round over Omara's leap and down to the Motul tabletop over on the far side of the circuit. So Cairoli quicker than anybody else over that side of the track this time around. He had set the fastest lap this race so far, Tony Cairoli, 143.4. He just did a 143.6 on the last lap, so he's pushing. And, and that gap coming down as well, 3.8. So he could sense a victory. That's the only other way he's going to get on the podium is to uh, close down Gauthier Paulin and take the win and those three extra points that he needs. Yeah, a moment ago we were talking about not even getting on the podium. If you passed Paulin and took a checkered flag here, I think that would be uh, considerably sweet for, the, for all the fans here. Kevin Strybos uh, just dropped back in the uh, closing stages of the first MX1 race. Kevin's such a confidence rider, isn't he? I mean, he took that start and led the half a moto in Brazil. I mean, that was only two rounds ago. But uh, just this weekend just hasn't been on it, and he really couldn't explain it yesterday. No, down in seventh in the first race, eighth in the second race here. Max Nagel, interesting, uh, I was talking to him on the MX Live studio show today, and uh, he said, you know, they're just not getting out the start at the moment. But I said, so what have you changed then since uh, Brazil, where he was making hole shots and, and getting to the front, you know? He said, well, yeah, we've changed some things, but they're just not working. So, <laughs> you know, really, just go back to what you know. But then maybe they lose elsewhere on the track. So that's why they have to make the, the gains, because we've seen Max Nagel just here on the Honda World Motocross machine, 
when he's uh, down on the first turn, he knows he can pull through, so there's nothing wrong with the bike in that respect. But you need that, you know, where do you sacrifice? Do you go for the whole shot and then sacrifice a tenth here and a tenth there, but be second, third, four? Or do you sacrifice the start and have a bike that's good for the, the duration of the race? You know, yeah. it's, um, it's a decision that team make and, and that's it. I mean, they're flipping between mappings as well, you know, in the for, uh, for the start on the first lap. Uh, on these fuel injected bikes, but I think with Nagel, you know, he, he was really enthusiastic about the, the, the change in strategy they made, um, you know, to attack the first lap, to be more aggressive and make progress there. But it seems to have sort of, you know, had a lapse really from that kind of form. It's almost like the momentum's been sucked out a little bit. As we watch Tommy Sell, he's really closing up to the back of uh, Clement de Salma, and that gap uh, just reducing, it was like four seconds, it's just holding at that point. So as Tommy got enough uh, gas in the tank, had a bit of a heavy crash yesterday in practice. Earlier on in the, uh, the race, we were talking about the, the hills here, what the camera does, it just flattens everything out. You listen to the bikes as they drop down that hill. I was just listening to Tommy Searle then as you were talking, and they literally just blip the throttle off the top, they give it one squirt, and then they pretty much cruise. They're not on the gas like they are at Fox Hills, where the, you know, the incline is uh, a, less, a lot less severe. This is a real steep drop. Um, so you literally don't need to get on the gas. You just, you know, second gear out the corner, blip, jump 10 or 15 feet or whatever it is, 20 feet, and then land one quick burst short for maybe a second or so, and then it's back off yeah. the gas because the momentum that you're carrying in that bottom corner, you need to change down and hit the brakes to make that corner at the bottom of the hill. So what I was saying was so interesting that you were listening to the bike noise. No, there. no, 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 but I, you know me, I've got uh, five different brains going on during this race. Timing screen, monitor, yeah. you, me, what we're listening to, what we're watching on the track. It's just uh, no, I mean, people you're don't right, realise. Yeah, but also, you know, it's worth bearing in mind these uphills and these long stretches, you know, maybe he has got a little bit of a disadvantage on that 350 because last week on that on A, so slippery, so tight, so winding, you know, just to get on the power, the, the rise wipe, blah, 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 all the way around on the 450. No one could really, like, crank open the gas and really force their way around the circuit. Erne, race one, part two here. Second moto, Italy, Maggiore. Tony Cairoli closing in on Gautier Paulin. Fastest lap of the race on lap 17, 143.2. Phenomenal stuff from the defending champion. Wants to be on the podium, wants to win a race, doesn't want to disappoint the fans. The only way he can do that is go after Gautier Paulin and pick up those three extra points that are vital to get him at least third on the podium here this weekend. Gautier Paulin has led from the very first lap. And you sense the crowd here urging Tony Cairoli on. Maybe the painkilling injection has just kicked in if, in, if indeed he's had one. But he cannot afford to make any more mistakes like he did in moto number one. Gautier Paulin will sense the pressure. He could still win the Grand Prix even if Cairoli goes through. So that's not even an issue, but he'll want to win it. He'll want to win it in style. Cairoli will want to get on the podium with a win here because, of course, he's not been off the podium and he's oh. not finished lower than second any point this year in the overall Grand Prix. The octave, the, uh, the noise out here on the, uh, the track, absolutely reaching a crescendo as their hero and six-time world champion Tony Cairoli really putting himself to the test. After dropping down by about, what, 10 or 12 seconds, he's caught right back onto the rear wheel of the factory Kawasaki of number 21, Gautier Paulin. I think we've got just, I tell you what, it's going to be very, very close. Yep. I think we've got four laps, including this one. It'll be three laps to go as they go through. Who's going to win? Cairoli. I'm going to say Paulin. Cairoli's got the momentum. I mean, we might come up to a couple of back markers as well, and that was Cairoli's undoing in France. Paul Lann, has he got anything to but, respond? But Cairoli's got the advantage this time. Even if the back markers aren't seeing the blue flags, they will hear the crowd. They'll know that something's happening. They can look at the whole shows at the top, like Billy McKenzie's yeah. the first back marker to be lapped. They'll look across, they'll see Paul Lann and Cairoli coming through, and they'll be right. Do not get involved in this battle because we're not leaving here alive. Yeah. Otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Tony's either going to pass Paul Lann and go, or is this going to go? They're going to circle, you know, together right up until the finish line. We could see a kind of Alex Tonkov kind of move on the finish line. Cairoli needs a point. So to, he needs uh, to pass. Well, He's actually, three points will put him second. Yeah. So uh, this is for second overall in the Grand Prix. And would knock Clement the South from the podium. That would be. Uh... He won't mind about that. <laughs> <laughs> Cairoli goes up the inside of Gautier Paulin. He knows he's got a race on his hands now. Does the factory Kawasaki rider number 21, who's led every single one of the 18 laps so far. Watch this scrub here. It's, it's, it's so dicey. He needs a little kicker, and it wasn't too, too extreme that time, but on the previous laps. First race was 21 laps. This already 18. We're on lap 19. The atmosphere building here. Cairoli going for victory in moto number two. Final corner, eight oh. seconds, three laps to go. And Cairoli is going to cut it back. an opportunity. 
Yeah, Goethe, Paulan cut it there. He wasn't taking any risks. And now Cairoli swings the inside. Paulan's going to double his way no. through. Might just pull a bite length, but he was a little bit short. Didn't make any gain there. And look, even the Marshall's getting in on the X. <laughs> Cairoli oh! at the inside. Oh, talk about banging bars. He gave a Paulan a love tap at the end of pit straight last weekend as they rejoined the start, remember. As uh, Paulan's back wheel just uh, swung out. Oh, Cairoli almost taking out the sphere of signs at the top of the hill. Doesn't want to get close, doesn't want any brake checking going on. Look how deep that hole is there. That's what you can't see. Your foot pegs absolutely disappear. And if you've got a motocross bike at home, you know how deep that is. Yeah. I mean, uh, Paul Lanz is going to be tough to pass. He's going to be wide. He's going to be just using the power of that Kawasaki. He's out of the corners. He's finding the traction. He has done all race. And, you know, but Cairo's corner speed is just so nice, Paul. We're just keeping it a little bit. You can hear the engine noise again. It's just keeping that momentum through. Well, suddenly the atmosphere picking up here. What looked like it was going to be a dull end to a second moto here and an overall victory for uh, Gauthier Paul Lanz. Paul Lanz still looks on course to win the overall Grand Prix here. But Tony Cairo going from fourth in the Grand Prix, looking at potentially going from fourth to second. As uh, he's taking a smart lines, he's just riding right the inside, got here, Paul Lanz, just using, using the Kawasaki to get out oh. of the corners. Kairoli's got to do it in the entrance or mid corner. Ooh, oh, sick whips from both these guys, really working and utilizing every ounce of skill and energy in the closing stage of these races. We're coming up to the two lap board. Kairoli needs to find a way through. If he's to get on the podium, he needs one point. If he takes Gauthier Paulin, he'll pick up three points, and that'll put him second, as you said. Taking uh, Kamal oh, Asana to the podium. A mistake from Paulin. Kairoli goes through. No. Squaring him off. Oh, around right the outside. That's atmosphere. Was... <laughs> atmosphere. It's amazing. <laughs> Again, the double from Paulin both. Paulin just holding that inside line. That's the best way he's going to win this race. So how many more opportunities does Tony Cairoli need to find a way past the number 21, Gautier Paulin? Our announcers down there, they'll have the same information as we do. They know he's not on the podium at the moment, but every ounce of shouting and cheering from the Italian fans here this weekend in this second moto on the final lap and a half will certainly be a big benefit to Tony Cairoli, but just going too wide there. And then he's uh, just losing a little bit of time, but he needs that momentum to get back onto uh, Coach Paulant's rear wheel. Might go to the outside here this time, like he did Coach Paulant up the inside. Ooh, mistake from there, but he's going to swing through here. Get on the gas nice and early, jumps along into the hole. Now it's just the that little uh, that elongated turn by the end of the pit lane ball. That's that's where Kaido is very strong, got a lot of speed through there. Paulant made the mistake, and you know that's almost where he managed to pass. I think there's not many other opportunities. So Tony Cairoli then, having another go at trying to find a way through. So go take Paul out. Doing just enough at the moment. But Tony Cairoli, how many times, Adam Wheeler, have we seen Cairoli, when his back's against the wall, just pull something out of the bag right at the last moment? I don't know if I haven't said that. I think it's Gautier Paulin is the one who's pulled something out of the bag. That was a good lap. That was a good, definite... Might you know, be the fastest lap of the race, The though, last maybe. two sections, especially. 44.6 when Kai Rowley's done a 45.8, and you can just see the bike length. Re I mean, really, he's running out of places now. He's running out of places. Doubled his way through there. I think Paulin maybe just did as well. He's got one lap to go. Kai Rowley needs to draw on every ounce of his experience. And Trekcraft to try and find a way to close back in on the rear wheel and make something happen here on his final lap. But Gautier Paulin has also dug deep. And the, uh, the Kawasaki factory rider looking at taking what could be a third Grand Prix victory here in MX1 in 2013. But he knows, and maybe Tony Cairoli now, now knows, that uh, he might be yeah. safe for a victory. Cairoli might have just given up the fight here. And he's uh, pulling up, actually. He might have just clunked his knee again. In the closing stage of this race, Paulant just making a couple of mistakes. Cairoli's disappeared. He's there right at the bottom of the hill. That gap around about five seconds. Where's De Salle? De Salle hasn't come through. I not, cannot see Clement De Salle anywhere. De Salle? Clement De Salle has, has gone, gone missing. He is outside the top 20. He's not pulling up on the, any of the timing screens. So in that seen respect, Cairoli now then might be. Unless there's a problem with the transponder, we'll wait to see next time as they come through, which puts Cairoli on the podium by default with 40 points, which is where he would have been anyway. And Paul Ann just looking around the onboard camera, just checking that Cairoli has kind of uh, conceded this one on the last lap. Well, it was 1.2 seconds. We know it's a lot more than that now. 
I'm going to keep an eye on uh, De Salle as they come over the line potentially because that would be a, a big upset for De Salle. Gauthier Paulin comes round the final turn. He takes the chequered flag, wins his third Grand Prix victory of the year. He wins race two here at Maggiore in Italy. Antonio Cairoli cruises past pit lane, past his mechanics, and he takes second in the race, and he will be third overall in the Grand Prix. He's going to be in a lot of pain, though, by the look of things. He's going to be helped off that machine. A long way back for Kenda Dijka. Good to see those two so sporting after uh, these bruising battles that they have. But and here's the Dyke up. He's third, and uh, Billy McKenzie a lap down. I'll tell you what, Paul, that's a big uh, big win for the championship, that. Tony, Tony Crowe is still, you know, got a good cushion in the, in the point standings, but that was, a, that was a good moral victory for Gautier Paulan. Yeah, Tommy Searle there, so no to South. So Paulan, Cairo, to Dyke Van Horbeek. Searle comes over the line in fifth place. And then it's going to be Max Nagel in sixth. And then Strybos in seventh. As we look here, as they're out of our window, here's Gautier, Amy. third Grand Prix win of the year, and probably one of the best battles we've seen all year with you, Antonio. I mean, we start to fight every weekend with Antonio. It's a dream. I'm really liking that. I enjoy every minute, every corner I'm riding. I never give up, and we start to pay. So, first all shot of the year, all the laps on front. I mean, I can't dream better. I get uh, he was, he, we was fighting, and he win in France. Uh, I win here at his home GP, so no, it's all really good. I want, really want to thank also the Italian public and all the Tifosi because they are really excellent with me. They are behind me, like not like in France, but uh, a lot. So thanks a lot. Many to congratulations. Coach A. Paul, sounding a little bit like uh, Christophe Porcel last year when uh, him and Kai Rowley, Porcel and Kai Rowley traded uh, each other's Grand Prix victories, but you are a bad ass. this time it's down. <laughs> to uh, Gauthier Paulin, excuse the uh, expletive there from the, the fan, congratulating Gauthier Paulin, but uh, yeah, Gauthier Paulin celebrates in style, he wins the race and the overall Grand Prix, this is how he did it, that's what it meant to him to win here in Italy, a place where he grew up racing, where Paolo Martin at Honda was one of the first guys to give him an opportunity, and uh, you see the emotion on his girlfriend's face there, and his own as well, so uh, a big, big moment for him here. He would have grown up, he would have known about this track here, came from BMX, remember, as a, as a kid, and uh, wasn't long before he started winning at European Championship level, he was a European champion, riding for Martin Honda, then he got his big opportunity riding for Kawasaki, then he went to Monster Energy Yamaha, and now here he is riding with the Kawasaki Racing Team, winning the Italian Grand Prix. An official confirmation then for MX1 Race 2. Gautier Paulant wins. Ten and a half seconds in the end over Antonio Cairoli. Dijk was third. You see the points they're given on the uh, right-hand side. Jeremy Van Horbeek was fourth. Tommy Sell, Max Nagel, Kevin Strybos, and uh, David Egonieri was Xavier Borg night. Bodicek was tenth. Bob Rochef, another tough Grand Prix race for him. He was 11th from Barrigan. Dennis Ulrich, Billy McKenzie, Mattis Caro, Joel Rulantz, Rue Gonsalves, Stefano Dami. Nikola Pashinsky and uh, Santu Tienen. And then uh, the big news of that race was no finish for Clement de Salle. So I don't know if it was mechanical or if it was a, uh, an injury or a crash from uh, Clement de Salle. The overall Grand Prix will belong to uh, Gautier Paulin, 45 points. Takes three points out of Kenda Dijka and five more out of Tony Cairoli. And then Van Horbeek, fourth overall this weekend, just ahead of Nagel. Strybos and Searle with Guineri picking up eighth at his home Grand Prix this weekend. Xavier Borg was ninth for Moda Sal. No points after winning Moto number one. Big news that for the Rockstar Energy Suzuki. World MX1 rider just picking up 10th place overall this weekend. It's absolutely pandemonium outside. The fans running from the track want to get down to the podium. They want to see Cairoli there at the very, very least. And uh, what a great podium we have there right in the middle of the skybox. So the championship then, Tony Cairoli still leads, but uh, he's lost five points to. Uh, Paulan, so 51 now the, the uh, deficit, 
but no change in the uh, classifications. But uh, Guarneri moves up three, Bobrashev drops one, Xavier Ball climbs two, Simpson and Roulant both lose positions in the overall classification this weekend. Mattis Caro on the STR KTM climbs two places to 18th. So the fans making their way down from the hillside, making their way onto the start line area. Ready to witness the podium here at Maggiore. <laughs> Tony Cairoli then leads the championship, but it's KTM who lead the way in the manufacturer's chase. 426, no change this weekend. Kawasaki second, eight clear of Suzuki with Honda, Yamaha and TM just down there at the bottom of that standing uh, leaderboard. Well, what a fabulous Italian Grand Prix. It's been in MX2 and MX1, third overall. Tony Cairoli limps his way out onto the podium. He'll be disappointed with third place, but uh, he's on the podium. That's all that matters for him. He had two options. One for Tommy Searle to find a way past Pomoda Sal, or to find a way past Gauthier Paulin in the end. De Sal went missing. And uh, he capitalized on that. Kendra Dyker, his Red Bull KTM teammate, comes home second. Gautier Paul and Kawasaki Racing Team takes his third Grand Prix victory of the season. A lot of respect between those guys on the podium. Thierry Shiza Suzoni, team owner of Kawasaki Racing Team. Third place trophy for Cairoli. Paolo Schneider, one of the organizers here. And thanks to him and his partner, who we might see in a moment, we are back here at Majora after, uh, well, since 1999 anyway. Robert Razor, the FIM uh, vice president, or maybe uh, Razor. Actually, yeah, American. And uh, Jorge Viegas, the FIM deputy president from Portugal, hands Gertje Paulan his winner's trophy for winning the Italian Grand Prix. Here's the second of the organizers, Stefano Avandero. Good work, guys, a great Grand Prix. And we'll remember this one just as much as all the rest, I'm sure. But Gautier Paulan, it's an emotional victory for him. But Cairoli continues to lead a world championship. Dr. Wolfgang Schröp, the director of the FIM CMS, on hand as always to deliver him another red plate. But look at the emotion. The outpouring of emotion on Gautier Paulin's face as he wins here in Italy at this historic venue of Maggiore. The national anthem for France. And Kawasaki, winning manufacturer this weekend, will get the national anthem of Japan. Gautier Paul and wins round nine of the FIM MX1 Motocross World Championship here at the historic venue in Italy. Does it in fine style as well by winning MX1 race two. Kendadaika was second overall, and the home crowd hero Antonio Cairoli on the Red Bull KTM was at least on the podium in third, but he'll be disappointed personally that he wasn't able to do better in front of his home fans who've come out in their tens of thousands to this wonderful circuit.
Here's how it went down in MX1, race two. Xavier Bourg grabbed an early lead, but it wasn't long before. Gauthier Forlant was away. Kaironi didn't waste any time in getting into third place. And then he was all over the back of uh, Xavier Bourg. Kenny Dyke had thought about making a couple of moves up the inside. Tony Kaironi started to lose ground, though. Van Horby came through. And he was having to work extremely hard. At that point, he was off the podium. Eventually, he found a way up the inside of uh, Xavier Borg. Borg went down, though, in that little exchange up front. Gauthier Paulant was clear at the head of the field, putting on a masterful display. Kairoli found a way past Jeremy Van Horbeek, got himself into third, and then found a way past Adaika to get into second, but it still wasn't enough at that point to get third overall in the Grand Prix. He needed to go after Gauthier Paulant or have a problem for De Salle, and it was the latter that played into the hands of Tony Kairoli. Tried this move up the inside. Bang bars with the guy who won race two. And that, of course, was Gauthier Paulin. So Gauthier Paulin winning moto number two. Tony Cairoli coming home second. That was enough to get him on the podium in third. But Ken Dijker, his Red Bull teammate, came home in second. So uh, good day for the KTMs. We're getting ready to speak to our winner. Here's Amy with Gauthier. Gauthier, you look really emotional there on the podium. What was it, winning here in Italy or just the occasion? I mean, I walk so hard every day, and to be <laughs> racing like this, it's a dream. And now I'm walking so hard every time I'm on cycle for four hours. I mean, to race like that, it's a dream. I really want to thank all my family, my girlfriend, all the sponsors, and we keep pushing. I well keep, done. I keep Massive outpouring of emotion then from Gauthier Paulin. The hard work, the hours, the dedication. That's what it takes to beat the very best in the world, and uh, Gauthier Paulin doing it for the third time this year, but for some reason, this one meaning more to him than, than the other two in Bulgaria and Portugal. Well, that's all we've got time for here. So uh, it's been a great Italian Grand Prix. My name's Paul Manning. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time when we go to Sweden in uh, two weeks' time. And uh, it was fabulous to visit the circuit here in Majora, and hopefully we come back again soon. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.